Okay, hello and welcome to episode 25 of Dano Says So. Um, today's guest and I have gone round and round, and round about doing this for a while. And uh, one of the things that was always in play was the context of it. And I'm going to share with you guys a challenge he hit with me a few months back uh, to just spend this time talking about Planet of the Apes and Muscle Cars. <laughs> I don't know if I can honor that, but with everything that's going on in the world right now, I think restricting ourselves to some fun topics is going to be easy. And in the case of Scott Hill from Fu Manchu, he has toys and he has jams and rigs that are fun for me to explore. So this is going to be easy. Scott Hill, thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. All right. Um, there's that punk rock thread that runs through all of these for the, most, for, the, for the most part. And you and I have been in close proximity to each other ever since we were young punk rock boys, you know, honing our craft in a shitty little re rehearsal studio in Anaheim. <laughs> you know, yes. well, it, it goes, it goes on preacher stomp box is our first exposure to each other. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? No, I think I'm friends with the, I was, you know, friends with the half off guys. Yeah. With Vadim and, and, yeah, Bill, yeah. and I think I, uh, I think I had gone with Vadim. Did you used to live in a huge house in Long Beach with a couple other guys? No, that's not me. That's not you. Okay. Nope. Okay. Then, then it must have been Stompbox. In a town full of huge houses full of guys. I mean, that's how I met Doug McKinnon. <laughs> I somehow didn't end up being one of them. Got it. Got it. Yeah. But I just remember um, walking into that house and they were right. blaring that antidote, you know, the first antidote seven. Right. Like, yes. That, that antidote seven inch came up in the Gavin Oglesby interview. and. Gavin Oglesby is decidedly not a New York guy, but it is hard to argue with the glories of that record. Oh, I, I, I love that record. Yeah. Like, that song, what's that, uh, Something Must Be Done? Yeah. I play it all the time at practice. It, I love that riff. Love it, you know, love it, love it. This wasn't my intention in terms of how to segue into this, <laughs> but no, 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 no. But I think we should dwell on some punk rock because two people who, who pick up on you later in your musical career They've got this big monolithic, you know, road thunder thing in front of them that's very easy to, to sort of encapsulate and keep in its own space and be satisfied with. Yeah. But you are a dyed-in-the-wool enthusiast of a certain strain of punk rock. Now, I want my Stompbox story in here real quick. You remember who John Master Polo is? He's the bass player in, in No For Dance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did okay. you have like grades or something? And eventually, when he was in uniform choice. making oh, that, Okay, I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, when Nova Nancy was practicing next door to Fairlands, you guys fired up and were tuning, and the distortion was so thick, and the volume was so high, he hit the wall with the he hit the wall with the palm of his with the palm of his hand. It's like, oh, I'm going next door to talk to these Barneys. I'm gonna straighten these guys out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So you know, even in 1928, you were generating a wall of sound, sir. Yeah, we we love to be loud. Like, and still, my main thing is stage volume. Like, I got to, it ha, like, that's the whole reason why I got in a band, just bought, like, guitar, loud, and even at practice, even nowadays, full stacks, you know, we're, I love it. I, ca I can't play soft. When was like, the last quiet. time you played through a half stack? Um, I mean, uh, we, we have it at, at, you know, we have it practice. Um, probably, I don't know if I've ever played live. Do a half stack ever? I'm liking ever. I'll never. Never is I mean, a good answer. When 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 Fu, when Fu Manchu first started, I played out of a full stack mm -hmm. with a hundred a two hundred watt Mesa boogie head okay. and another stack with a hundred watt Mesa boogie head. So there's three hundred watts of me, and then our bass player had you know big amp. So it was. There's a lot of wattage running, but I just I don't know shit about rigs. But this, but this is a curiosity question. Like when I interviewed Pete from Verbal Assault, I couldn't resist asking him how the sound happened. Well, you and somebody I play with, John Coyle, you both have done that two head thing, and the only other yeah. per time I'd ever been aware of it was Gin doing it, right? But I mean, is that is that a matter of it, 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 if thickness allows you to have two different sounds going at once? I mean, what's the what's the what's yeah, the it's motivation? Like, it's like. Well, we have two guitar, I mean, we mentioned two guitar bands, so I don't need to do it anymore. But like, when we started, it was just me playing I, one guitar, it was just me. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, you have one sound coming out of this side and you can tweak that other sound. So it's like two different tones, 
like two different guitars, but it's, you know, but it's you playing out of them. You get two right. different tones, like you know, yeah. so it sounds different, but it's still full, you know. And uh, mainly, I think for like you know, like you guys, you know, with one guitar, he can get a full gnarly sound with two different tones, but still just him. Yeah, he does. I know he uses a stereo cabinet, but I mean, yeah. The way I would describe it is, I think John likes to get it to it to the point where it sounds like it's about to break, and then he's happy. Yeah, yeah you know? that's. Yeah, that's about where you need to be. Okay. And, and Stomp, um, yeah, Stompbox, we, I'll give you a quick story about Stompbox. Yeah, sure. that, we used to just crank it, just fucking crank it. We loved it. I mean, not just because I don't know where We just loved it. And no doubt used to practice in that big room. That was the comparison I was about to draw when you would make that. It's because there was all those dirty fucking hardcore types, you know, there. And then there's this beautiful young woman who I think was doing backups when she first started. And all their trumpets and their tight little pants down at the end of the hall. Yeah, they, I remember. When, I, I didn't mean to hijack you. Keep going. No, we were, it's, it's just funny because they were, they were, they were always trying to get that big room. You know, the big, yeah. the one. So we'd get, you know, one of the smaller rooms and they would always complain for some reason we always practice on the their, the day they were there and they'd always complain to like the owner hey, can you tell those guys to turn it down and he would he was cool he's like nah it's practice you gotta do you know whatever mm -hmm. you know he was always cool he's just like hey can you turn it down and we're like sure turn it up a little bit more you know <laughs> never would and then finally i think she had come over you know knocked on the window and we're like oh uh we so we opened the door we're like hey what's up and it's like, can you guys please do me a favor and turn it down? We're like, yes. We, so yes, for her, we did turn it down. Right. Yeah, but that's it. And then quickly, you know, but yeah. No, he, uh, he, yeah, and even before she was this this mega star, she was probably the queen of the stomp box. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, she, yeah, yeah. I mean, there. that's not really my, you know, I'm not really into the band, but, you know, it was – it's cool seeing them go from there to like, you know, just like. Oh, yeah. It's, it, uh, you and I come from an era when we're exposed to so many people. I mean, actually, you included, who just saw this massive escalation in their musical careers. I mean, her, Zach, you know, all these, yeah. you know, the Offspring yeah. guys, all that. Like, Orange County was really a, a hotbed for, for mainstream artists who came from the underground. They're probably the most dramatic because I don't think people picture them. I don't pick, think people picture them sharing space with the apes that they did back in the day no no you know? like yeah look at us too you know yeah yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. We're, yeah it's uh i i think i i love it i mean i may not be my type of music but i think it's great you know go right. practice in the same spot that i was just making noise and they're just mm -hmm. monsters you know so right. i love it it's great so um the heritage end of it that i said we, we kind of stumbled into um the guitar that i see you play most often has ssd right there right yeah. there under the strings right yeah. And has SSD control all over the back of the neck and where it doesn't have SSD, it's got blast. Yeah. Uh, to me somehow, and I think people who speak the language will get it, but the, there's a symbiosis there. There's a, there's a similarity. You know, there's a, there's a particular strain that I'm seeing in the hardcore that really appeals to you and obviously flag. But I mean, what would you say about that? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I can guarantee you, Black flag didn't exist. SSD didn't exist. Blasting it didn't exist. We, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't. I would not have started a band. Yeah. You know, without, without, I can say, no matter shadow of a doubt, with those three bands didn't exist, I, I wouldn't be playing. Yet you sound. You probably don't think so, or maybe you do. Yet you sound nothing like them. Um. No. I. I Virulence. Probably we were trying to ape probably blast at some point and mm -hmm. always black flag and SS, you know, so it, Fu Manchu, no, Fu Manchu doesn't sound like, but all I listen to is black flag, SSD, mm -hmm. blast, poison idea, articles of faith, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's, and I, when we're, especially when we're writing Fu Manchu stuff, I don't listen to any like heavy stuff just cause I can't, really? you know, like, oh man, I'm gonna be like, oh crap, that sounds like, you know, Sir Lord Baltimore or cactus or fog, you know, crap. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm going to put on Poison Ideas first EP and then, you know, and cruise around and then, you know, go to practice and play something slow. You know, it's just, it works for me because there's no threat of me ripping that, you know. I'm not I get the way that translates. Um, you know, I'm in a band, I'm in a band that gets hit with the flag thing a lot, right? Yeah. And I get it. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I don't get it, but the vocalists who influence me in the way that I try to write vocals now, 
have none of them were in black flag yeah you yeah. know not not even close i so i mean i think that's the the vocalist equivalent of what you're saying yeah pretty pretty much yeah i uh like gin look you know I, I first off i couldn't play anything close to what he plays uh, the guy's insane he's my favorite guitarist of ever ever really All time heaviest like damage my favorite record ever Heaviest record I own out of anything, rock, honk, heart. That's the heaviest record ever. So, yeah, I'm never going to, you know, if I think, hey, well, that's kind of black flag. No, it's nowhere near, you know, it's, but without that dude playing, I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be in a band just because there's such a huge influence on me. Just black, flag, black flag is a trippy thing. And I think by the way that we frame this episode, we can just afford ourselves nerd talk, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But Black Black Flag, it's funny. I like all the records. I like all the records all the way through, all the way through, you know, Loose Nut, In My Head, all that. I like I like the hidden tracks on the cassette for In yeah. My Head more than some of the songs on the album. You know? Yeah. Um, Out of This World and that stuff. Well, it's funny, I don't like the production on any of that stuff. And that may be why I've never thought again as some kind of a guitar guy. Because live, those songs still had bite and blew your head off yep. and were yep. remarkable. But those records sound really smooth. And I think maybe to a guitarist, you can still get what's happening to a singer who doesn't even, isn't even sure which end of the fucking thing he's supposed to strum. Yeah, those yeah. records are not nearly as biting. I agree. The later period, I think it's, maybe it's just the, the sign of the times of recording around yeah. then. It's like, when we did like the Virulence record, that, that was nowhere near how we wanted it to sound. It's yeah. just that's, we didn't know. We're like, ah, let's go in the studio. Oh, you know, we we had no idea, and it's just like, oh, okay, well, it's kind of, sounds kind of cool. But it's just maybe that's the way it was. You know, maybe that's just I know, like Loose Nuts got that big boomy, mm -hmm. you know. So, but this to me, the songs are so insane. I'm I'm good with it. They're just mm -hmm. so good. Like they're so good. But then you hear live versions of them, you're like, oh god damn. Yeah. yeah, well, it's like that thing. I think a lot of people really embraced Blast when they showed up, because it was it was like a, it was like it was a lot of it was like late flag, but with but with the shine sanded off. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was like untreated wood. It was full of splinters, and it was. Yeah, you know. yeah, I agree. I agree. That's. Yeah. Well, so we're hovering to... around here. Go ahead. I don't want to. You got to. No, thought. no. I was just. I was going to get into a story about. Black. Go. Ahead. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Hey, man. This is about you and your stories. I can talk to myself alone. Uh, no, I'm just like because I remember the first time we saw. I'll give you a quick rundown of how I got into Blast, which is a huge, huge influence. Uh, me and my friend, who's singer of Virulence, we'd go up to Toxic Shock like once a month. Mm -hmm. so get like a hundred bucks each or what 70 bucks whatever however much money we could get and just buy everything we'd go up there and look you know get flyers on the way out and saw a flyer for jfa kreutzen swa and the faction like, yeah the faction never seen them just amp they i love the faction stoked go back up the toxic shock maybe three weeks later you know try and buy whatever we can get and look at the flyer and faction's not on blast is on and we're like, what the fuck? What? Ah, Jesus, who's Blast? And Bill Tuck was working there. I was going to say, you went on a Bill Tuck, Bob Durkee mission. Billy Casey and I used to do those. Really good. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's all, uh, he's like, we're like, oh, what happened to the faction? They're not playing. He's like, nah, Blast is playing. We're like, who's, who's Blast? And he's all, he's like, do you guys like Black Flag, SSD, and some Sabbath, and weird timings, and heaviness? And we're like, yeah. He's like, okay, get there early. Don't get there late. Get a so we're like, oh shit, okay. And you know, made it a point, got our advanced tickets and got there. You know, I think uh who opened them? Uh, Mighty Sphincter opened. Just weird. You know, you know them? Yeah. Well, I yeah. recognize the name. I can't say that I was ever a big Sphincter follower. No, no, the same, but we whatever. They played weird, just really weirdness. And then I think SWA played. And then as soon as SWA was done, blasts were setting up. We're like, okay, we're sitting out kind of up in the bleacher, the seats, mm -hmm. watching them set up. We're like, whoa, look at all those amps. And the bill with the huge drum set, we're like, oh, shit. And then, you know, they're setting up and we're like, okay, let's see, you know, we'll, if they're good, we'll go down. And then just, I remember Steve and Mike were just starting to turn on the guitars and just fucking loud, you know, full stacks for those dudes, just mm -hmm. loud. And we're like, oh, shit. 
run down there in the front and then they're they started with uh, only time will tell which wasn't even on the first record and it's that bass and then that little intro guitars the other guitar other guitar, just yeah we just we shit our pants we're just like right. that because i can tell you that is the moment uh november well, i think what is it 23rd 1985 <laughs> Look, man, that's a, that was a big, that's a big deal to me because we Apparently. wanted to, we wanted to play like a million miles an hour early Gang Green, mm -hmm. you know, like early early DRI, just get in, get out, and then we had all these songs, and then we saw a Blast, and we're, and I swear, after their set, I was on the way home, I was telling Ken, who was singing in I'm like, okay, we're going a different direction, you know, we're slowing down, we're making it, you know, and he's like. Yeah, uh, I agree. And that yeah. was no, that to me was the turning point of getting into heavy, tweaked, you know, from then on, we went, you know, from there, uh, you know, just slowed stuff down, tried to get heavy, getting some amps, trying to do weird tuning, you know, chords and stuff. And yeah, so that that I can pinpoint their set as a huge and I, t I like neither lives up the street for me. So yeah. You know, friends with all those dudes, Clifford, all those guys, Steve. And I always, you know, I'm always going off on blast and it's like, ah, whatever. They don't, they're just like, ah, yeah, blast, whatever, you know, fuck, ah, ah, thanks. You know, I'm just like, if they only knew, I mean, I think they know. I'm, I'm always like, uh, you know. There's, there's certain yeah. people, and I think often guitar play, players who feel that way about it. You know, John Coyle's that way about it. Yeah. There's you know, yeah. yeah. like, there's, there's no comparison. To me, a step further back, what I will say, there's a very real thing that's good that I look when I say it's Gin, Niter, you, you know, what, 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 what appeals to John about playing guitar. This cult of Dan Armstrong thing <laughs> is very real. And so it's, you know, like, who's, who's the next successor? Who's the next, you know, who's the next Lord of the Plexiglass? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. How many do, how many do you have? At one point I had nine. Nine Dan Armstrong. But it was. I, I bought one because of Black Flag and Blast. I, I went to the Guitar Center in Santa Ana. Remember where was there? Yeah. The Guitar Center. And they had one on the wall. And this is probably December 85. And I remember going in there and I'm like, oh my God, they have one. You know, no internet. You can't, like, you know, you can't, it's hard to find one. And right. I'm like, oh, how much is it? And he told me, I think it was, it was something really cheap and crazy. It's like 600 bucks. And I remember, oh my God, I'm six or five, and go, you know, oh crap, all right, now I'm going to try and play it. And he's like, do you want it? And I'm like, yes, I want it, but I don't have the money. And so I, whatever, go home and begging my parents, my dad, oh, dad, oh, the guitar, strong guitar. You, he's like, what? You know, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I'd work, I'd go, he worked uh, in Tustin at a big ball bearing company. I'm sitting there rolling ball bearings and count <laughs> ah, you know, listening to 76% uncertain, you know, and, ah, you know, in this little cubicle, do it. So, but I finally saved up, bought it and just loved, you know, loved it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then when Fu Manchu started, I had a Les Paul and then I wanted to get a Jet Fender Jaguar. So I, my dad was friend, friends with a guy at Fender and he's like, yeah, I'll just give you one. Here's just a jag. I'm like, holy shit, you know, damn, what, you know, so I played those. I didn't play the Armstrong. I played it for briefly in, in Fu Manchu and then played the Les Paul, Les Paul because I saw Soundgarden and I was just like, Jesus Christ, that sound, holy shit. Right. And uh, so anyways, put the uh, Armstrong away and then we were on tour with Fu Manchu probably 97 in St. Louis and that's kind of where ampeg is and doc raiden the guy who worked there everybody knows this guy and he's like oh yeah you used to play armstrongs you know i'm like yeah i, I still got mine and i love him he's like yeah we're reissuing uh the armstrongs this year would you want one and i'm like oh my god yeah so whatever the next year we we're playing a few shows with motorhead and we were at uh the palace and okay. we go to our backstage room there's an Ampeg box and I'm like, Oh crap, this must be the arms Armstrong and opened it, took up the Armstrong and you know, they're all, you got to tweak them. You got to like new bridge yeah. pickup and stuff. And like, Oh, awesome. So, you know, I, I, he had his number. I called him. I said, thanks man. This is really cool. And put a pickup in a hot rail pickup in pickup in there. Got a new bridge tuners and 
like, holy shit, this thing's gnarly. And, you know, and I'm like, man, can I buy another one? Can I just buy one? You said you gave it for free. Let me... He's like, he's like, do you really like it? I go, yeah, I'm gonna start playing them. And so he goes, okay, cool. He sent me four more. <laughs> this, I mean, just seriously, he sent me four. And I'm like, what I'm I'm I don't about think this. I can afford. Oh, I'm like, I can't afford all these. And right. so I called him on the phone. He's like, no, 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 those are that we want you to start playing them. I'm like, holy shit. And then our other guitar player, Bob, he sent a couple for Bob. Bob played them, but then he went back to SGs. And then so I told, you know, the guy at Ampeg, I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to, uh, it's just me playing them. Uh, thank you. You know, thank you very much. He's like, okay, cool. He's like, I, I just want to make sure you're set up with them. I go, yeah, man, you sent me four of them. That's, you know, oh, you're awesome. He sent another four. Jesus Christ. And I'm like, holy shit. I go, I had to call him. I'm like, dude, did you screw up? You sent me another four. He's like, no, no, no you need backups. He's like, if you want to go to Europe, leave some in Europe. And you know, Leave some in Europe. That's what he said. <laughs> leave some with, because we have a tour manager there. He's like, leave them over with that guy. And you can just, I'm like, holy shit. So I had, at one point I had nine. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of ours had to get brain surgery. So I auctioned off one for money for him. And then uh, I think I gave another one to a friend. Um, I think I gave one to Niter, uh, which is weird because he's one of the reasons why I got one in the first place. Right, well, you know, full circle. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, but yeah, I had nine at one point. It's, 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 I, would, I, would, I would offer up that it has probably been a wise investment on Ampeg's part. I mean, given, given over the ensuing years, your visibility, the amount of time you guys – been on the road and the fact that even the unanointed the equipment unanointed like me identify the guitar with you i <laughs> yeah. don't think i don't think they're missing those nine guitars <laughs> no no i don't i don't they're not even a, i don't even think they're i don't think he works there anymore and i, I think they stopped making those a long yeah. time ago so yeah they're they're kind of rare but i just love them i, I love them and they even sent me some wood ones then they yeah. start making wood ones and they play awesome and again, you got to tweak them and stuff. But well, how how common are, is, are the ones with the smoke finish? The, the ones that are translucent, but they're dark. Those are rare. I mean, they, those are rare. And then, man, I think Niter had an all black one back yeah. in the day. Gin had a black, and I think Niter's was a guy from. I want to say Three Dog Night. It was one of those bands, type of bands, mm -hmm. and Niter didn't like it so much. We so sold it, and I'm, you know, I was, and I'm like, oh, and now it's worth probably just ridiculous amount. You know, I remember right. I, sometimes I hassle Niter about it. He's like, don't shut up, shut up. So I don't think I'm ever going to be telling stories like this about sure mics with PVPAs. <laughs> don't see it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so there's one type of toys. Um, yeah. Let's get into the legendary ride. Let's talk about this Red El Camino. Yes. Well, the El Camino, I. And it is, it is the one, it is the one on the record cover. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, that I had gotten that, it, that picture for the cover. I grew up kind of around Huntington beach as a kid. So I'd always go to the from. pier. I'd always go to the pier, surf, skateboard. And my dad's a big muscle car guy, car guy. He's got 49 Mercury, had Porsches. You know, he got the black Trans Am after smoking the band. It was, you know, so he, he's, he had to get it, you know. And then I'm like, let me cruise around. He's like, no. Nah. You know, I think I drove it to the prom or something. And, uh, you know, and anyway, so he's like, he got me. He's the one that where I got the muscle cars. But the reason why I got the El Camino, I remember, and I remember this vividly, and that's why the cover is that image, uh, California Crossing cover, walking to the pier with a couple of my buddies. I mean, we must have been 10 or maybe 11. And I remember seeing that exact setup in El Camino, surfboards in the back, two dudes in the front talking to girls. And I'm like, yeah, I got, I got to get that when I get older. I got to get, you know, that's, I got to have that. And I had the opportunity to buy an El Camino and I'm like, okay, I got to recreate that cover for our record. And that's it. And, but yeah, that's my, that's my car. And now my daughter wants it when she wants to start driving, which is cool that, I, that the girl who's going to be 16 wants that. But then at the same time, if I'm cruising around town and I see some dude driving it with her in it, oh, oh trouble, trouble. 
trouble. My thought was my first car, right? My first car was a '55 Chevy. Oh, nice. Right. Nice. Yeah. But I didn't drive it. It was in. Oh, it was yeah. in the garage, and we were working on it. And I had a '62 GMC Suburban. Such a thing actually exists. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. It looks, it looks like a milk truck. No, but where I'm going, where I'm trying to freak you out about your daughter in the El Camino, is I was in six wrecks in five months in that car when I was Amazing. 16 years old. Oh well. <laughs> you know, but so, here, but here's the good thing. Those cars are made of full metal. So yeah. it's got to be somewhat, you know what I'm saying? There's a big front end, a big back end. So it's mm -hmm. like, I'm kind of thinking about it. But then I'm like, damn, why was to see some dude driving that thing as I pass by, you know? Oh. But no, that's, yeah, I've, I've had that car since uh, I got that in 98. Mm -hmm. I had to do a little bit of work on it. Um, but I mean, I live... I mean, I live in San Clemente, and I, I don't really drive anywhere. It's like, the well, it, if a car, if a car, ever suited a dude's personality and persona more, I, I'm not familiar. With it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I love it. I love it. You know, it's just uh, always one went. Like I said, man, first saw it when I went to the pier in Huntington mm -hmm. when I was a kid, and I'm like, I got to get that. That's that's my, you know, two dudes. Mm -hmm. Two boards, two girls. I'm like, right. even though I'm like, yeah, okay. That, I guess that works. That whole scene works. So, first time you and I ever chatted about cars, you mentioned another ride that you don't let anybody ride or drive. Is that still around? The 49 Mercury. Yeah. yeah. It is. Now, here's the thing that's my dad's. Okay. Never let anyone drive it except my wife. Okay. So, he. Yeah, sure, she can drive it. Me? She, well, she probably has the appropriate gravitas towards the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just it's weird because you know he let me drive it. You know, a little hesitant, but he'd gone to a car show in San Clemente, and he wanted to hang out with his buddies, but he wanted to get the car back home. So you know, he's like, "Oh, Nikki's my wife. You can drive it." And I'm just like, "What? You know what? You know, of course he lets her. You know, of course." Right. But yeah, it's. That car is still around. I got to get it. There's that needs some work, but I do want to get that one running, uh, up and running because that's a cruiser, man. That's yeah. Have you been in a forty nine Mercury? No, and, and I and I, I will tell you right now, it's too much car for me to ever drive simply because of its class. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I when I was gonna be when I wanted to drive a tough, beefy car with a big engine, I didn't reach back that far. About a seventy four no. Nice. You know, oh, nice, nice. You know, I love the look of it. It had a pretty yeah. nasty, nasty engine, and I felt very cool. Yeah. But I don't want the responsibility of an over. <laughs> I don't want responsibility for a fucking artifact. You know? I know. I know. I, I would always, yeah, I, same thing. I'll drive it. I'm like, eh, it's people are looking at me like, look at this idiot, you know. But my dad, you know, beard, gray beard, you know, he's like 6'6", yeah. six, six, big dude, and, you know, he fits. And, you know, I'm just like, hey, everybody, hi, you know. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I got to get that running. I'll get the, I got to get that thing running again. Okay. It's, yeah. It's all right. So we have talked the toys of Scott Hill. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk some Fu Man too. Yep. Um, first off, and then you've heard it from me a million times, but immense gratitude for everything you've done for me and mine musically. Uh, you know, we've played we've played together four times in the last couple of years, and they're all you know. Th I'll pr I'll treasure it forever. Look, man, I I like your band. That's it's simple. I like your band. That's. I want to see you guys live to where I don't have to like drive somewhere, you know, and then come up. I want to, you know, it's cool. So you've that been cheating. You just play the shows instead of coming to the goddamn show. <laughs> no, I would listen. I would, you guys get your shit together. And as soon as bands start playing on there, you know, All right, fair but, enough. uh, yeah, I'm just a fan. I'm a fan, dude. So well, it's, this, that was meant as a momentary, but necessary and deserved. Thanks. This is about you guys. The jump from virulence to Fu Manchu isn't hard for me to picture creatively, okay? Maybe just because I've witnessed it. But, you know, when I watch, I watch everybody slapping these different things on you guys, whether it's cheesy as just calling you metal or desert rock, stoner rock, yep, yep. Uh, this and that and the other thing. It's not what I see. I see a really clever infusion of just heavy music and all the best things about popular culture when I was growing up. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, like, here's the thing, like, in Virulence, I just played guitar, wanted to play guitar, not, no vocals, no writing lyrics, I just wanted to just play just, ah, oh, guitar loud, you know, and I, here's another, another defining moment for me, I remember sitting on my bed, 
in my room in my apartment with me and the singers shared in San Clemente. And Virulence had gotten to the point where we were writing these weird long songs and 15 parts to every song. And I was writing this one song and must have had eight or nine parts. And I remember sitting there going, God, I can't come up with it. There's, I need another, you know, and then I'm like, what the fuck? This is like three songs in one already. What am I doing? You know, I'm like, what? Right then I'm like, okay, forget it. That's it. I'm going back to two riffs and some weird bridge or a stop and I'm out. And, that was, and I remember telling the singer, I'm like, can you play guitar? Because I want two guitars, simple. And he's like, no. And he went back to, he was going back to college at the time. So, but I wanted to just back to basic, you know, just simple two parts, get in and get out again, just like hard, or really hardcore stuff. And so I, I've seen you a bunch of times now. I went on, I went online, you know, I, to me, it's fascinating technology that I can watch YouTube on my own television. Yeah. Right. And so I hopped on YouTube on the same TV that I watched my Raiders on. And uh, I watched, it might've been Hellfest. It might've been something that was a big stage show in Germany from maybe 2018 or 2019. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was easier to just sit back and analyze what you guys are doing walking death than it was when we've played together, right? Yeah. And so I'm looking at it. And it's a very simple thing. You do have you do have very simple songs, which yeah. usually take which easy either take tempo breaks or just structure breaks. They strip down and then they come back in. But what's interesting to me is watching who's doing what. Because you're providing an absolute fucking am, anvil. You're providing these the cinder blocks in it, right? Yeah. The other guitar hangs drapes all over everything and then comes back in with you, which isn't like that uncommon a thing, but I don't know anybody who does it better. You guys create immense weight within that space. So, you know, congratulations on that. Well, that's good to hear because yeah, we're all about like, I want it to be big mm -hmm. and pushing, you know, like pushing stuff, air, you know, right. pushing. and yeah, Bob, I mean, it's like, yeah, he does like, I, I don't even, Question, like, I don't even say, hey, can you do that? It's just like he does. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's perfect. You right. know, he's, he's really, all those dudes, Reader and Brat, all those guys are really good. Like, I'm the worst. I'm just the worst. Like, I'm the worst dude. You know, <laughs> I'm lucky. I'm just getting, you know, I'm just playing riffs. And Bob's doing all this insane guitar stuff. And Brad, bass lines, Reader drumming. And, yeah, it's, it's we, after Virus, I just wanted to go back to Simple. You know, just simple riff, like a couple stop, like all our stuff works with one riff. Mm -hmm. We start with one riff, everyone's that's cool, the reader got drum beat, yeah, all right, yeah, let's stick with that. A part, maybe some weird bridge, maybe some weird outro, we're gone. You know, that's yeah. it. That's, and that's how we work. We're not a big jammy type band. Right. Um, you know, it goes back to, again, being, you know, listen to hardcore stuff, like get in and get out. You know, and, and it's an interesting thing. Your crowd picks up on it subconsciously. I'm worried that people are gonna gonna see this as being a little bit more of a fawning or a congratulations, congratulations interview <laughs> than we usually do. But I've had a ton of musical exposure to you over the last couple of years, and I think about music more than the average idiot who can't play an instrument. Yeah, yeah. Right, and maybe my only talent in music is probably an arrangement, which I don't do much of these days. Because a lot of my old bands, I did. Yeah. And Fu Manchu structures make sense and translates to the live audience in a big way. There's a very readable arc to the energy in the room over the course of a song. And we, when we played with you guys at Pappy and Harry, so we played together in the desert. Yeah. And it was the first time being exposed to your crowd and I thought they were going to eat us alive and totally reject it. No, they're rowdy ass heavy music fans. And they absolutely fucking bought in and wrapped their fucking arms around us. It was fun as it possibly could be. So you got a good thing going, sir. Yeah, no, I'm a very lucky. We, yeah, I mean, we're, we're a lucky band. You know, we've been around for 30 years and it's like, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know? So we're, we're very lucky. And I think, I think, to, I think what people get is the simplicity of it. Yeah. You know, it's like, you don't have, yeah, you don't have to think much listening no. to Fu Manchu. Lyrics or music, you know, that's, and to me, that's straight up, you know, that, that's what I like, you know. I'm there's just, almost a shame, there's almost a shameless to it, let's do it. The shamelessness is what's magic about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like you're, like I never wanted to write lyrics mm -hmm. or sing, like I didn't want to sing. Well, you know, when I'm, you, when you do covers and you fest to me about doing the vocals when you and I are messaging back and forth, 
it's high comedy. Like when you're, you know, whether, whether it was the doobies or who, and you were like, yeah, I had kind of a hard time keeping a straight face with this shit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's, we, I take a lot of stuff like, like we were talking earlier, Planet of the Apes crap or any sci-fi stuff or mo muscle cars, vans, old choppers, just stuff that doesn't mean it. You know, simply like stuff you don't have to think about. That's what I mm -hmm. love. Like to me, I don't like thinking about when I'm listening to music. I just like, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a big, I mean, I know you are, I'm not a big lyric dude. Like there's, Eight billion people that write better lyrics than I, you know, more meaning. Mm -hmm. Don't look to us for any answers. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I have a worse confession than that. Younger me wrote better lyrics than older me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, that's just, you know, it's just like we're just a. I think we're just easy to get into. I think that's why people like us. You know. Absolutely. So you mentioned back there, you spat out the number thirty. Um, visiting upon a common downer, but we're having fun, so we'll keep it fun. This was supposed to be a big fucking year for you guys. Last year was our yeah. 30th. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We had, that was our 30th year. We had, oh, my God, we had a lot of plans. Like, first thing we were going to do was record three, ten, three, three song 10 inches, kind of one in February, have it come out, another one come out in July, another one come out in December. Each one will have a cover song and then two originals. And... We were going to just, okay, we gotta write, we gotta get ready to go in the studio. Let's write, you know, come up with two songs. Don't really think about them. We like them. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Oh, let's change a little bit. Cool. All right, that's it. Usually we stick to a song and can play it for a while, maybe play it live. With these, we wanted to just immediately, like, this is where we're at right now with these songs, you know, and cover songs. We always try to take a cover that's not really. A heavy so like you know we did take it to the streets by doobie brothers cool. you know and just make it heavy and so you're nine yeah. feet you're nine feet tall with a lion king mane and you do a fucking devo cover sir yeah we're we're huge uh, that's another huge i mean devo huge fans you know and i'll give you a quick story we went we were playing the whiskey back when that record came out 98 99 and we went to the devo studios circular studios and our manager got us in there talked to mother's bob we're like holy shit you know all nervous hey. look on the floor there's freedom of choice master tapes we're just like jesus what's going on holy crap what are we i mean we were seriously freaking out and bob our guitar player is just mega devo fan. so we're just freaking out whatever he's showing us around and there's more master tapes we're just like holy crap and so anyways, whatever, he's showing us right. We're, thank you, man. Thank you very much, big fan. He, he's like, I love the version of Freedom of Choice. We're like, oh, my God. He's like, but you sang the end part wrong. We're like, oh, fucking hate. Damn it. Which I, I knew I did. I, I remember being in the studio. I'm like, I should probably look on the lyric sheet, make sure I'm doing it right. And I'm like, nah, I'm just going to go for it. And, but anyways, so yeah, big Devo fans. And, you know, we try to take covers that, you know, wouldn't really – be associated with us doing and and tweak them you know but we did have yeah back to the 30 year we had a bunch of stuff we had a lot of touring we were going to do like eight months of touring last year we were, had all these reissues that were going to come out um play some weird shows like local stuff where we do just a cover set all covers maybe a set where we just do you know uh early record all the way through so yeah that was the bummer but you know it's you know if that's you know i i'm i feel bad you know oh that sucked we couldn't play the record you know there are much worse things going on in the world than us not playing a fu manchu record you know yeah um it's an interesting thing i was you know i have my first hand experience but i try to do a little bit of research for every interview right but my understanding of the calendar as of 2021 you don't have anybody in the current lineup who hasn't been in the band for less than 20 years, do you? Yeah, yeah. Like, I have never known that kind of stability. You know, it's, we all get along. That's yeah. it. We just, we did, if we didn't get along, we would not, definitely not, because as you know, you get into a tight van mm -hmm. and you have to drive up to Frisco, which is eight hours. You got to, you know, everyone's got to be joking around and get up, you know, hey, let's go <laughs> eat here. You know, it, it's, we all get along. We've never had a guy in the band that one of us didn't know. 
Like I've never been like, oh, look at that guy over there. He has a guitar. Oh, maybe I'll see. You know, it's always been someone we grew up with or like Brad worked at a music store in El Toro with Bob when they went to high school. So it's like, he's like, we're looking for a guitar player. Said, hey, I got Bob, Bob, let's try him out. And so I'm like, if you know him and he's insane, he's already in, you know? So it's, you know, and then Reader was in Smile, you know, we played a bunch of shows with those dudes and it's just always a guy we knew, you know, I just, <laughs> it might be just me not wanting to meet new people you know, and then I got to, oh, God damn, I got to meet all the, you know, and I'm well, not the biggest. I, I can relate. There's starting to be, particularly as I've been to people I've been talking to as I'm doing to the podcast, there's starting to be a library of musicians from my past that I'm like, fuck, I really want to play with that guy again. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's like, it, it's familiarity. And then that's it for me. And I just, I'm not the most social person. So I'm like, you know, like, cool you knew that you grew up with this guy and he's cool he's in you know if he's if you know and luckily you know readers an insane drummer so it's like you know you're in dude we've known you for a while. bob you know brad grew up with him he's an insane guitar player and our original bass player when we started with fu manchu recommended brad who's our bass player to play second guitar and i'm like ah nah i don't i don't i think i'm just gonna play guitar just one guitar you know and then we went back I don't know. I don't even know how we got back to, you know, oh, I should get a hold of Brad. He played, you know, I'm like telling Brad, I'm like, hey, man, do you know anyone that plays bass? He's like, oh, I'll play bass. And I'm like, do you play bass? He's like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but he's insane. He's insane. Music. All the dudes in the band can play everything insane. Drum, the guitar player who finger picks when he's on bass. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, he's insane. He didn't, he didn't start out like this. I better learn how to play with my fingers. Boom. Play with his fingers. He's all the dudes, like those guys can, Every instrument, not just good, but like insanely good. You know, again, I'm the hack. You know, hey, here's a two chords. Check this well, out. If you're the hack, if you're the hack, you guys are so <laughs> hey, no, no joke, man. I'm always, hey, Bob, what, what, how do you play this? He's like, oh, man. I'm like, oh, okay, hold on, slow it down, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, I, Brad joined in 94, Bob 97, Reader. 2001 I think yeah so yeah 20 years yeah. like the yeah it's just we got to get along that's I, was, the guy, I, I think know. the longest I ever went with one lineup was and I don't think it was one lineup just one name but it was like six and a half years you know dude it's you know like I was thinking about it and I'm like yeah 30 fuck holy shit 30 years damn you know, that will probably lend itself to recovery from all the garbage we're going with now like that yeah. level and familiarity because i'm sure you can't know when people are full of shit if they think they know when yeah but, no, I would imagine, but i would imagine you're at least loosely formulating the you know plan of attack for the rebuild uh slowly you know it's like we were just i was just talking to our drummer reader and we were talking about I and mean, we haven't practiced forever we're just like you know not that long ago but it's like you know masking up and you know we're trying to be safe and you know I'm, i i gotta you know I'm hanging with my mom who's 80. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm stay away. You know, everyone, you know, I'm, yeah. that's more important than playing this riff, you know? So, you know, uh, yeah, we're slowly trying to think of shit for this year, but I, I, I don't, I don't think anything's going to happen until the end of the year. I mean, I really neither, don't know. Neither do I. I always have these, these great resurrection fantasies about my comeback from COVID, my personal comeback from it. You know, and I would be saying by March, I will have been living in the gym and we'll yeah. have, you know, we'll have four more songs and we'll turn these eight songs into a this. And, you know, yeah, the yeah. next shows are going to be unlike, unlike anything everybody's going to ever seen from me. And then it's like, well, OK, by next summer. Well, OK, by next fall. Oh, wow. You know, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of time in the gym there, Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. I know the same. I just bought a bunch of new cables, like cords and stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I got to get these get stuff ready. And then I'm like. What? What are we ready for what? My only thinking is, and Timmy Chunks from the Token Entry and Let Rage, and incredibly good guy, he was talking about how he was positive he was going to use this turn time to write songs, and he hasn't written a fucking one. You know, it's it's numbing. It's a weird space. It is. It is like we're never without some riffs. We're all every practice yeah. we, you know, it, it just that's the way it is. It's just we always have stuff and. It's to me, it's not as not so inspiring to write, you know, I'm luckily for me, I mean, when all before this happened, we had a bunch of stuff 
and I mean, probably like 20 songs and we're just, you know, Damn. just a lot of stuff. I mean, just a lot of stuff. And so it's almost been a year coming up and it's like, you know, I play guitar every day. I, I play every day. It's guitars are sitting right next to me and I'm picking you, up. Every, I'll get to it. I didn't mean to say I pick one up every day and play, but it's like, I'm not right. Like usually I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. I'll t you know, I got my four track here on a cassette, press play and record, play it about two minutes. You know, there you go. There's that. I have that. Haven't done that much. You know, it's like. I used to write, write every day. Yeah. There's an independent, there's an independent uh, book imprint in, in, out of Encinitas owned by a friend. And they asked me for, I call it verse because poem, the word embarrasses me, but they asked <laughs> me for fit, but they asked me for 50 pieces. To do yeah. A quick book, you know, sort of, you know, while COVID is still going on and everything else. Some month ago, I've written four. Yeah. You know, and I, it, used to be, it used to be I could just write on demand. But yeah. There's like a deadness to this space. I do think it's an opportunity for create to challenge oneself creatively. And as it goes on, we're not just all going to curl up and die. So I do think interesting creative projects will pop up. And I do think interesting works from existing artists are. But really, we're all still adjusting to something we've never fucking lived before. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. Big time. I mean, Look, I'm a big sci-fi fan, huge sci And, you know, probably at some point across my mind, like, oh, I wonder what would happen if the world shut down, you know, from watching movies. And then now it's like, oh, Jesus, no. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, no, what did, oh, crap, I got to stop thinking, you know. But, right. yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, all you can do, you just got to, you know, I do like our, man, you know, planning out stuff. So, you know, giving hope to, okay, let's, you know, hope maybe October. Let's, you know, let's shoot for October. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we're gonna put out another ten inch. We gotta, you know, we're gonna get stuff together for that. But yeah, it's uh, it's not as inspiring as it was, at least for me. I mean, maybe the other dudes are like, oh man, I got eight hundred songs. Like, oh shit, you know. But the reason the reason I raised my finger, you press your own stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's no there's no creative obligation or nobody breathing down your neck other than no. yourself. It's ourself, yeah. That's yeah. We we kind of. Um, we'd been on, God, I mean, a bunch of labels. We were on huge Disney. We were on Disney and then Century Media. We were on smaller labels, Mammoth, you know, Bongload Records, uh, um, Elastic, you know. And we just, I think it, at one point we said, let's, let's give it a shot. You know, let's just try it. Let's see if, and we, we'd pressed up a seven inch, I think. Strikes me as a smart move. And it, 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 I mean, but for us, like we would go on tour, you know, six weeks, come home, take maybe 20% of what we made, put all right, it's in Fu Manchu account. That's going to go towards recording, play maybe a couple local shows. Okay, we're going to do that money. That's going to take care of the artwork and press it, you know, mastering. So, yeah, we just kind of figured let's give it a shot. You know, we've been on a lot of labels. Let's, let's try it. And the only bummer, I mean, you got to come up with the money. You know, that's like, you know, that, that's like a, you got to come up with the dough for all this stuff, which, you know, we've been pretty good at putting stuff away, saving stuff. Everyone like, you know, if we got 10 grand here. We're going to take, you know, 3000 and put it towards, you know, everything goes back to the band pretty much. That's the way we all, we've always ran it. You know, most, almost everything <clears throat> just goes back to the band, you know, probably not intended as such, but for all the bit that we talk like of this silliness and talk about the funness and, beat up on the skill sets it's probably i mean i at least i find it's kind of inspiring that somebody who can kind of call their shot would circle back to essentially diy whether you want to refer to it or not yeah and yeah. to come back you've kind of i think when you start dealing with volume and dealing with international travel and everything else a better word for it just might be you circle back to the notion of complete control and that's pretty exciting to see it 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 was scary at first and then because we we're like you know we didn't know but like we had our manager who's like you know without that dude i don't know where we would you know, he has 8 million insane, awesome ideas, you know, and he guides us, you know, through all, all the, you know, we're like, Hey, we want to give it a shot. Let's all, you know, he's, he's the fifth dude. So he's all of us together. Like, you know, decided we're just going to, we're going, we're going for it. everything we're going to do ourselves. I just, it's fun. I, I, I do like doing it. And we even package up the records and, you know, take them to the post office. I mean, I haven't done that. We haven't done, don't do that now, but it's like, 
before we, you know, we have to send out like 1500 LPs, you know, each dude gets 400. Okay. Let's, we got to get these out. Let's go, you know, let's go, you know, you do that this week. I'll do that next week. I'll take these shirt orders, get the, you know, so, but I do like it. It's fun. It's, you know, you're in control of your, you know, of what you want to do. No one's telling you what to do. You right. Know, we, we want to put a, a you know, we, we fucking put a 20 minute song on side two, you know, of our yeah. last record. So it's like, you know, a label would have been, eh, are you sure about that? And, you know, but, you know, it's like, fuck it. We're doing it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Scott, this was an absolute blast. We went uh, longer and deeper on the chosen subjects than I expected to. And I think that's a good thing. Well, I had a good time, dude. And oh, yeah. I just want to say, I hope you guys are going to get your shit rolling because I would love a new record from you. Oh, that's no joke. I'm not just saying, oh, because I'm talking. Uh, from, your, from your mouth to the boy's ears because, you know, it's, you know, middle-aged men with limited opportunities being inspired <laughs> to do something, you know. No, I mean, they... No, yeah. Listen, I think those guys are fucking ringers. So thank you. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know. I'm just a fan. Like, I'm a big fan. You know what I'm saying? Like, you guys are my favorite local... Like, there's not a lot of, like, bands around and when you got when I first heard you guys, I'm like, holy shit, yes. A band that's uh, now I gotta send now vocal. I gotta send Scott a fucking check for this interview. God damn it. No, it's no it's no <laughs> joke. I mean, I was telling your guitar player that too. I'm like, fucking I love it. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like a band around that we can play, you know, we can go somewhere in Anaheim and play together some small like I always want to play with like bands close and do weird little things, you know. I mean, hopefully right. we can do that hopefully soon, but uh you know, I'm a fan. I'm. Uh, we're all big. All of us in the band. That's where we. You know, last show we played was with you guys. You guys are the last band I saw live. You are too kind, but that is not what this space is intended for. Well, so hey, I'm whatever. I'm going to cut you the fuck off, sir. <laughs> you're gonna um, edit. No. But, I'm just. We're fans, dude. We're. You, you guys are the last band I saw live. Well, uh, what do you call it? The the the. Uh, the it's a mutual admiration society. Oh, very nice. Now I have to figure out how to press my own shit and move tens of thousands of dollars. I. You know. <laughs> Rob a bank, get some money. There you go. You know. <laughs> Put another 17 years in with this man. <laughs> you there, man. Yeah. All right, Scott. We're laughing. We're smiling. We're getting the fuck out. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, man. Uh -huh.